Well, good morning, Bridge Church. So good to see you guys today. We are very, very colorful. I like this. I like this. Welcome to the Bridge. Ugly Christmas sweater Sunday. But we are here to see Jesus. We're here to meet with him. So why don't we stand together as he is our joy, he is our strength, and we're going to sing it out today. to the world the Lord has come let earth receive her king let us make room for him today that he is our joy he is our strength let's sing it out let it rise up like a river overflowing Holy Spirit let it pour out with no Joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord. 
joy of the Lord is my strength. Oh, my soul, bless His name. All that is within me, say. Oh, my soul, bless His name. All that is within me, say. Oh, my soul, bless His name. All that is within me, say. The joy of the Lord, the joy.
together hark the herald
die, born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Jesus, we worship you today. We sing glory to the newborn King, the joy that has come from heaven to earth to be our strength today that we can sing these songs of worship where we can come and adore our Savior. Jesus, thank you coming, for coming so long ago so that you can meet with us here today as our Savior. We worship you and we give you all the praise. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Please be seated. At The Bridge, we group for growth. Our groups serve a purpose beyond social gathering. We believe that God uses people to form people. So the goal of our group's ministry is to create environments where spirit-driven, life-giving experiences can flourish. It is in these smaller groups that people can get close enough to know each other, to care and share, to challenge and support, and to be accountable to each other and to grow together. Personal growth does not happen in isolation. It is the result of interactive relationships. So our groups help people forge connections and strengthen their faith. No matter what stage of life you're in or what life situation you're going through, we have a group for you. If you're exploring your faith, purpose or meaning of life, we have Alpha. We have both afternoon and evening options available. If you're going through a season of life where you're needing support and encouragement, we have seasonal groups. Seasonal groups are support groups for adults who are going through similar life situations and needing support. We are offering a wide range of seasonal groups this coming winter. Whether you're recovering from a loss, going through a separation, struggling with finances, needing to strengthen your marriage, or your body for that sake, we have a group for you. Lastly, we have life groups. Long-term support and growth takes place when we do life together in life groups. We have groups meeting in homes and online, and we have new groups starting this winter. In life groups, we learn God's word by digging deeper into our weekend sermons, spend time in prayer with one another, care for one another and serve together. This is how we grow together. So if you're yet to be connected into a community at the bridge, why not consider a group that fits your need? For more information or to register, check out the link provided on the screen. We look forward to journeying with you. Remember, growth happens when we do life together. See you soon. Good morning. Growth happens when we do life together. I appreciate Pastor Anna so much and her leadership in our life group ministry. We're a church that gathers, groups, grows, gives, goes. We do all five of those things. We're a 5G church. And uh, I appreciate so much how she stewards over groups. Uh, last night we had a group's Christmas party. What a, what a fun time that was. If you're a group leader, yeah, yeah. If you're a group leader and you didn't make it last night, I feel bad. I, I want you to get out to these things, these focus events that Anna sponsors and her team. They are amazing and they're very, very uplifting. And they are a together moment. And uh, I, just, I just appreciate so much how she stewards over that purpose of togetherness in Christ growing. And uh, so thank you so much for that, Pastor Anna and the team and all those who are life group leaders. Let's give all life group leaders a hand, please. Yeah, they are frontline ministers. They are our pastors to you, the congregation. And so they help you with your learning, with your care. They help you with prayer and they help you with uh, your community involvement, your mission. 
And so thank you to each one who, who gives themselves to that. I'm supposed to remember something else, and while I'm chatting away with you, I'm like, my brain is going in overdrive, trying to remember what else I'm supposed to talk. Oh, there it is. It just came to me, just like that. So here's the other thing I need to mention to you before I start preaching, and that is, I wanted to bring to your attention this year's special offering on Christmas Eve. We do this every year. We, we find a point of focus, and then we finance towards that point of focus, and this year, our emphasis or our point of focus is on mission as a whole. And you can see up here on the screen, you can see two funds. One is the Christmas Eve offering. The other is the general fund. And here's some of the things you're giving to. And what we're asking is that the year-end giving here at the bridge be something significant this year. I think last year, giving hit somewhere around $300,000 for the month of December. We're hoping to beat that only because of what we see happening in January, and we need to finance what God is doing. So you'll see support for local and global missionaries, global crisis relief. We're making donations to various places throughout in the world where there is crisis happening, community initiatives and events, community partners. We have five community partners that we help to finance, and we're partnering with them as they are ministering to the community. We have missionaries all throughout the world, not even enlisted there, but we have a significant, robust, on-mission ministry. One of the things that we need for this ministry is a leader, and I've been saying this to you, that I'm, I'm dreaming for the day that we can afford to hire a full-time, on-mission pastor, and here's what I'm thinking, and I'm just musing with you here. I'm thinking that if we do real well on this Christmas Eve offering, if we do real well this might be the year that we take the step and hire a person to be our ambassador to the world, our ambassador to this community. When you think about what it is that we do by way of community influence, what ends up happening, I'm just going to let you know, we have community events, our, on, our seasonal groups, our community events, even our dance classes that happen. Probably 70% of the people that actually come to these things and I'm talking about seasonal groups, and I'm talking about special missionary or special community events, are people from our community. And what happens is they come in, and they come in for something that is something altogether different than, than salvation, per se, or altogether different from a spiritual experience. They're coming, and they're participating with us as a church in some sort of bridge event. But it's as they come and they spend time with us that they see Jesus. It's as they come and they spend time with us that they experience the love of God. And then they begin to unpack. And when they begin to unpack, what begins to happen is Anna, who is our life group's pastor, has to shift over into being the on-mission pastor, and she ends up spending copious amounts of time with people who are actually unpacking and becoming a follower of Jesus Christ over time. And so what ends up happening is she, she is running really the gamut of two ministries, and while we appreciate that, and it certainly is within her heart to do it, we know that we can't keep going like this. My sense of stewardship over Anna herself is that she can't keep going like this. So we as a church, we as a board, we want to hire an on-mission pastor. If we do well in the Christmas Eve offering, we're moving in that direction. So can you, get, can you give a hand towards that? Can you tell me you're hearing me? Thank you for hearing me on that because I really believe that that's where God wants us to go in 2024. And so much of what we see as the overall vision of this church over the next five years, that role, the on-mission pastor, will help us towards the fulfillment of that role. And then, of course, you've got all those other ministries that are happening that are so significant, so important. How many enjoyed the kids' Christmas presentation last week? It was amazing. 
It was so good. It was so amazing. What a great word that Veronica gave, Pastor Veronica. And it was just a special, special occasion. That's kids' ministry. Our youth have met this week. Over hundreds of our youth have met and celebrated Christmas. Our young adults are meeting and they're celebrating Christmas. We have so many great ministries that are happening here at the bridge. And we appreciate your support towards those things. Hey, thanks for wearing a uh, ugly Christmas sweater. I don't mean to insult you, but thank you for following up and, and for being involved in what we're doing here. And we just feel like ugly Christmas sweater is going to be the second Sunday of every December here at the bridge. And just appreciate you, you doing that. I, I, I got to be honest with you. I got up this morning and I, I remembered. And I thought, I don't have an ugly Christmas sweater. So I went to Giant Tiger at 9 a.m. when they opened. <laughs> And this is it, $29.99 right here. This is it. And, and someone said, not ugly enough. And I said, okay, all right, all right, I'll work on it. I'll work on it, I'll work on it. No, that's this morning. I was the first patron of Giant Tiger this morning. No joke, I'm in there, there's another guy in there, he's picking up a pack of cigarettes. I didn't know Giant Tiger sold cigarettes. He's picking up a pack of cigarettes and he's walking out and he goes, us guys, we get our shopping done fast, don't we? <laughs> he came in for cigarettes. I came in for a sweater. And I just said, yeah, man, we, we get in and out, don't we? And he said, yeah, man, we do. So we had a moment, you know? We had a moment. Yeah. So Christmas. I want to talk to you a little bit about the great gift exchange here today. Christmas is such an important season in our lives. I love it. And I'm learning to love it more and more each and every year. As I personally take responsibility for my Christmas, as I personally take responsibility for my Christmas, I say it one more time, as I personally take responsibility for my Christmas, my Christmas, the one that God gifts to me through his son, Jesus, becomes more and more meaningful each and every year. I have been, shall I say, the victim of commercialism. I have been the victim of hurt and pain and a number of other issues that Christmas seems to accentuate for one reason or another. It seems to magnif magnify whatever it is that's going on in our lives. But what I'm realizing and where I'm growing in life is I'm not really a victim. Now, I could be hurting, or I could be missing my mom at Christmas, or I could be a lot of things at Christmas. I could be harried and hurried and, and functioning in sort of this altered state of, of overstimulation where I've got to get here and I've got to get there and I've got to do this and I've got to do that. And, and I, can, I can absolutely be victimized by all of that unless I choose to take responsibility for my Christmas. And I want to encourage you to do that this year, to make Christmas incredibly meaningful. It's yours. It's a gift to you from God. And it's yours to make meaningful. It's yours to experience joy. It's yours to have peace. It's yours to listen to God's wise counsel while the world tries to grab your attention. Christmas is yours. It's a gift to you from God. Will you unwrap it intentionally? Will you go about your business at Christmas in such a way that you are helpful to yourself in the choices that you make and ultimately helpful to those who you will encounter in this wonderful Christmas season? Let me pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you would help us to take responsibility for our Christmas. I pray that we would not be a victim of commercialism or even the hurt or the pain that each one of us experience when we think of those who are not with us during this incredibly relational month. Father, I pray that we would be purposeful in our activity that we would read through Advent calendars and devotional experiences, that we would read the Christmas story out of the Gospels, that we would represent at our supper tables moments of prayer and thankfulness during this Christmas season. 
I pray, Father God, that every family would build a tradition where somehow, some way, Jesus is central. He's right in the middle of it all. I pray that every family, 20 years hence, would be able to look back and the kids of the parents who are raising them now, the kids of the parent or the kids themselves would be able to say, mom, dad, do you remember when we used to? And when they're remembering, they're referring to a moment when Jesus was central in your family time during the Christmas season. Father, I pray that each parent, each grandparent, each person would take responsibility for this beautiful season and receive it as a gift from God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so this year, millions of gifts are going to be exchanged. Father to mother, mother to father, parent to children, children to parents. Workmates, neighbors, significant people in our lives will be passing off gifts, receiving them as well. Every year in my neighborhood, the neighborhood I used to live in, before the fire, love that neighborhood, I would wake up on Christmas morning and every single year, several of my neighbors would drop off chocolates at the front door. They would do that quietly, somehow through the night, on Christmas Eve. And Deb and I would do the same. We would go and we would distribute chocolates at our neighbor's doors. I love that. I love the exchange. I love the thoughtfulness. And I love my neighbors. Following this, every year thereafter, Deb and I we would just do that same thing. As Christmas Eve was coming to a close, Deb and I would go out, go out into our, to our neighbor's door and quietly drop off a gift for our neighbors. It was just our way, our tradition of celebrating Christmas. I love the exchange. Did you know that God has a gift exchange program as well? Every Christmas, he's wanting to exchange something in your life for something fantastic, something that blows your mind. It's incredible. It's nothing like our gift exchange program. He has an incredible gift exchange program. We bring to him our worst, and God gives us his very best. We bring to him things that we would never want to have as part of our lives, and he gives us things that we could have only dreamed of. That's what God does. It's sort of like you walk into a store with a broken clock and they give you this big, fantastic 70-inch television, right? It's that kind of exchange. It's, it's even better than that, of course, because God is not just exchanging things. It's deeper than that. It's greater than that. It's about relationships and what God wants to do in our lives. So we're going to look today at three specific things, just three, that God exchanges in our lives for our better. The very first thing is this. When we give God our worry or our anxiety, God gives us the gift of peace. What an incredible exchange. We give him our worry, he gives us his peace. And in Matthew 6.34, we see where he says, don't be anxious about tomorrow. God will take care of your tomorrow too. Live one day at a time. The anxiety rate or the worry rate at Christmas is at an all-time high. Statistics show that we worry about the funniest things. We worry about the meal that we have to cook or prepare. We worry about whether people will like it or not. We worry about whether granddad is going to be kind and nice to everyone this year or whether he's going to be grouchy. We worry about whether our finances will stretch far enough for us to be able to actually buy gifts for everyone we'd like to buy gifts for. We worry about an extended or an amplified amount of things at Christmas season. But worry happens to us all year long and what God wants to give us is something that that lasts the year long, and that is peace. God will take care of your tomorrow too, is what the text said. Jesus says, don't worry, don't be anxious, yet we all struggle with worry 
and anxiety. We all do. I have a little Christmas tradition. Every year at this time, I talk about the stress of this time of year because we put so much into this time of year. You've heard this before, so this is a reminder from me to you related to what time of year it is and how it can affect us in a crazy way. We do a lot. We do a lot to ourselves by trying to pack so much into this one short window in our year. Think about what it is that we try to do. During this time of year, we decide to have more parties during this one month than we have all the rest of the year combined. I don't know why we do it, but we do this to ourselves. During this one month of the year, besides all these parties, we say, let's add this. Let's write a little personal note to every person we've ever met in our entire lives. Let's do that. And let's send this note to them. And as if that were not enough, we say, let's entirely redecorate our house on the outside and on the inside. We add that to the list. Then during this time of year, we try to buy a special little gift for every person that we love during this this time of year. And during this time of year, we bake. How often do you bake throughout the year? But during this little window, we decide to bake. But you do it during this time of year. Then right in the middle of all of this, as if this isn't crazy enough, we say, let's let the kids out of school for a couple of weeks. (laughs) Yeah, let's just add that to the whole thing. It's crazy what we do to ourselves, and no wonder we experience an amplified form of stress at this time of year. Worry is something that is not good for us. About 8% of what we actually worry about ends up coming to reality. So most of what we're worrying about, we're worrying about things that aren't actually going to happen. There's an old Swedish proverb that goes like this, worry casts a long shadow on incredibly small things. That's what worry does. So what's the problem with worry? Worry is what it does to us. It affects us emotionally, it affects us spiritually, it affects us physically. Worry has a physical impact on our lives. It creates stress and tension and headaches and insomnia and all those things. And you've heard people say, I'm worried sick, and they mean it. That's their reality. Did you know that there are over 7.5 billion headaches a year in North America? 7.5 billion headaches a year. And some of you would say, I've had some of those. His name's John, or his name's Frank, or his name's, no, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Some of you are having that headache right now. Now much of that is because of the stress, or the anxiety, it's because of worry, it's because of elevated expectations at this time of year. We start worrying about the fact that we're worrying, and that only adds to the fact that we're worrying. But God says something to us in the midst of it all. He says, here's what I want you to do. Get involved in my gift exchange this Christmas. You give me your worry, and here's what I'll do for you. I'll give you my peace. It's an incredible exchange. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, it says, give all your worries and your cares to God for he cares about what happens to you. When you give your worries to God, when you say, God, here they are, here's what I'm facing, here's what I'm feeling, when you give your worries to God, it does two things. First, it helps you realize that God is in control. Giving them to God helps you realize that God is in control. When we worry, worry, we often worry about things that are literally outside of our control. We think that by worrying about them, somehow we're controlling them. We're trying to control the uncontrollable and fix the unfixable, and we think that by thinking about it and ruminating over it, we can somehow change it or transform it. And the truth is, we're worrying over 
and spending so much energy on something that we cannot control. We might as well just release it and allow God to control the uncontrollable in our lives. It does a second thing. It reminds me that God is in control. We think that we're in control, but what worry does is it reminds us that God is in control and that he cares. He cares. God cares about what you're worried about. It may seem to you like the silliest little worry in the world. It may seem to you like this worry that you have, you wouldn't bother telling anyone else about because it's so infinitesimal or it's so small or it's so inconsistent, but it's there. It's there. It's niggling away at your confidence. It's niggling away at your sense of security. It's niggling away at your, at your, at your understanding of how secure your life is in God. It's niggling away at you. Here's what God would say. He says, I care enough about what you're going through to come to this earth to show you that I care about you and I care about what you're going through. When we give God our worries, we recognize that he's in control and we recognize that he cares. And this is the gift that he gives us in return for us being willing to give him what we cannot control. In John chapter 14, verse 27, it says, I am leaving you a gift, and the gift is peace of mind. Jesus says, I'm leaving you a gift, and the gift is peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give isn't fragile like the peace that the world gives. So don't be troubled or afraid. This is what the Son of God would say to us. What a gift. We give him worry and we get peace. One of the questions is, how do, I, how do I get in this exchange line where I can get the peace of God for the worry that I have? Well, there is this very practical step and it's called prayer. It's just simply talking to God about the very thing that's got you stressed or worried. Here's what's going on in my life, God. The Bible is so clear about this, this practical step. In Philippians chapter four, verse six, Paul says, don't worry about anything. Instead, that's like saying, look, you wanna worry, worry. But alternatively, alternatively, here's, here's another path. Worry is a path based on a principle. But here's another path based on a principle. And this is what he says. He says, instead, pray. What's the principle? I just went through it with you. You're not in control. God is. Not only is he in control, he cares. So where's the, what's the path? The path is to connect with God. The principle is that God's in control. The path is to connect with God. How do we connect with God? Through prayer. We simply talk to him about the very thing that's got us low. So he says, instead, pray about everything, tell God what you need, and thank him for all that he has done. So there's two things happening here in Paul's writing, and that is, one, pray, two, give thanks. One, lay it out before God, but then two, give thanks to God for all the times that he showed up in your life and has gotten you through. Tell him what you need, but don't forget the second part where we thank him. So there's a second gift exchange going on with God, and I want us to look at it briefly today. The second thing is, is when we give God our hurts, God gives us his healing. We can give God our worry and he will give us his peace, but sometimes we come into this Christmas season and what's amplified is the hurt that we carry, the pain that we possess. And, and God wants to say something to you about, about your healing this Christmas. When we give God our hurts, our habits, or our hangups, he's willing to give us a healing. And when you and I, we give him his, heart, his hurts, or sorry, our hurts, he heals us, and I hope you realize that every one of us in this room is hurting in some way or to some degree. We've all experienced unmet expectations either this week or throughout the year. We've all been disappointed. Disappointment is the deprivation of hope and expectation. Every one of us has experienced that deprivation, if not 
today, yesterday, the day before, or somewhere in the week or the year that we just had. Relationships don't always work out. Fathers don't always father. Mothers are sometimes absent or misdirected. This happens in life. And everyone carries a hurt. Every single person in this room, can you acknowledge that, carries a hurt. Everyone. Oh, that may not look like it. We all have the trappings of North Americanism. We drive our nice cars, have our nice houses. We've got our kids into our, so to speak, Ivy League universities or whatever. And that only hides the reality that in our humanity we hurt. We're in pain. Maybe physical hurt, spiritual hurt, relational hurt, but we're all hurting somewhere, somehow, some way in this life. Psalm 130 verse one says this, it says, from a sea of troubles, I call out to you, Lord. Psalm 138 verse seven says, though I am surrounded by troubles, you will bring me safely through them. Your power will save me. I see that phrase, sea of troubles, and that's the truth of what life in this world looks like. I just finished a book, a really good book about dealing with life's hurts and life's pains and it talks about the importance of grief in our life and that grief is the season that we go into when we accept the fact that we're hurting. We accept the fact that we've experienced a significant loss. We accept the fact that somehow life hasn't turned out the way in which we have thought that it should. And neuroses is the disease of avoiding reality. And neuroses leads to other ailments. Neuroses leads to a lack of wellness. Neuroses is this denial of pain. And there's a, there's a number of mechanisms that we use in, in the land of neuroses, but, but true grief is you embracing what is real and then you bring God into that moment, into that season, sitting amongst the ashes of whatever life has become for you. That's grief. And you bring God into that moment and you let him heal you. You let him wipe away the tears. You let him clean you up from the ash. Grief. God wants to be with you in the midst of those seasons in your life. The psalmist says, I called out to you, God, God, even though I am in a sea of troubles, and in Psalm 138, I'm surrounded by troubles, but I realize you're going to bring me safely through. In Nahum 1.7, it says, the Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. Hey, you wanna, you wanna understand the nature of hurt and pain and grief and loss? and then you wanna also understand the nature of God, go to Psalm 107, I'm not gonna expound on it today, someday I will, but go to Psalm 107 and sit with it. Let it speak to you about the reality of life and the reality of God in the midst of life. Psalm 107, sit with it. Just let the Holy Spirit come upon you and just sit with Psalm 107 for a period and a season of time. And let God give you the gift of healing in the midst of your pain. The third thing that God gives us, if we're open to it this Christmas, is we give God our grief and amazingly He gives us the gift of joy. 
That's what's on the other side of grief. And you may be thinking, I can never be happy again. You may be praying the prayer right now, God, I'm done. Please take me home. That might be your prayer right now. But I promise you that if you will bring God to your problem, instead of evading your problem and wanting to go to God, if you'll bring him to your problem, he will heal you. He will find him in the midst of your grief. And he'll take your sorrow and turn it to joy. The Bible says he gives us beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning. This is what God does for you and I. I used to think that the way to healing was just wait long enough and it would just go away. And it's true that time does heal some wounds, but I found in my own life, I found this is to be true that in other, and also in other people's lives as I pastor, that waiting is not enough. It's not enough. In fact, if you just give yourself over to waiting and waiting only, what begins to happen insidiously is some of the pains that you experience turn into things like bitterness, things like cynicism where you just sort of turn your heart off and you stop loving, you stop hurting. By the way, loving and hurting, they go together. You cannot avoid hurting if you choose to love in this life. You can't avoid it. Because the very people that you love are human and they're going to hurt you at some juncture in the midst of that love and that relationship. These emotions are so powerful. This hurt is so real. Say that to God. Say, I come to you, God. I bring it to you. And I pray that you will help strengthen me through this and help me to find your heart on the issue of what I'm experiencing. In Psalm 3011, it says, you have turned my mourning into joyful, not just joyfulness, but joyful dancing. You've taken my clothes of mourning and you clothed me with joy. Crying may last for a fortnight, but joy comes in the morning, the Bible says. And Jesus in John 16 says, you will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. This is the amazing, miraculous gift exchange when you are in relationship to God, he takes our worst experiences in our human experience and he brings about some new spiritual, relational, emotional, and physical reality. Joy, when it hits your feet, is a psychosomatic reversal of psychosomatic illness. So for instance, psychosomatic illness is when worry and anxiety are so eating you up inside that it begins to affect your body and you begin to get sick and you begin to, your countenance, your shoulders slump, your, your, your face becomes dour. You begin to show the pain of your pain in a physical form, and yet God's promising us that we will experience in him a joy that has a psychosomatic uh, sort of reversal where all of a sudden we move from a posture of pain to a posture of joy, and we actually start dancing. We, we start kicking our feet. Now for some of you, that in and of itself is a miracle. That you would start moving your feet to the beat. But isn't that wonderful what God's willing to do in our lives if we'll trust him, if we'll believe in him, if we will, in a no-nonsense way, take what is absolutely devastating us and just lay it before the Lord. 
Luke 2, 10 through 11 says, the angels said to them, the shepherds out in the field, don't be afraid. I bring you good news of a great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is Jesus Christ the Lord. Can I hear an amen? He is our savior. I've told you or I've shared with you in other messages that word savior literally means sozo and it talks to us about how God comes into our lives and saves us not only for eternity, but he saves us for earth. He saves us for our experience here. He saves us in the midst of our pain so that on the other side of our pain, we can dance with joy and we can dance with joy in such a way that people take notice and they too can bring what is theirs by way of pain to a God who transforms pain into some sort of positive emotional experience where God shows up in an incredibly special way and it absolutely exudes and emanates from our person and we become transformational in the way in which we're affecting the world. Now, yeah, Christmas, Christmas, Christmas. I used to hate it. If you talk to Deb when we first got married, I feel bad for Deb because she loves Christmas. Man, I used to mumble and complain about Christmas. I have some bad <laughs> memories. I, I, I hadn't yet experienced a healing. I, I went through some, some significant disappointment in my family through growing up, and Christmas was only a reminder of how broken that family really was. And so, so Christmas was, was tough. I was not at my best at Christmas. But now I love it. I love it. I'm, I'm being true. I love Christmas because it holds out hope to a world that is hurting. So Father, in Jesus' name, for everyone who's sitting here who came worrying, who came hurting, who came grieving, I just pray that you would be their portion and that they would take command of their Christmas by bringing it and laying it at your feet and allowing you to gift them with joy, to gift them with peace, and to gift them with healing. Father, would you do that for every person in this room? Let this be a Christmas like no other. Let this be a Christmas like no other, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So we're going to just take this cup. If you don't have uh, the communion element, would you just raise your hand? And I know we've got ushers that are ready to just give that to you. So we have someone up here. Just raise your hand in the balcony too, please. Just raise your hand high. And ushers, yeah, if you could just get people. I see people over here on, on your right, Bradley. Angela. loves you. God loves you. You are not alone this Christmas, my friends. God loves you and he's with you. And you may be surrounded by a family that hurts you or you may be surrounded at a workplace that is less than Life may not be working out for you in 2023 like you had hoped and you're worrying. The beauty of worship, the beauty of communion is that we're reminded of how much God loves us, how much he's with us. Do you know this little wafer? It literally represents the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
What's the incarnation? It sounds like a milk product. The incarnation is literally where Jesus leaves his heavenly state, his perfect state, and he takes on human form as a baby in a manger. For God so loved the world, the Bible says, that he gave us his son, that whoever would believe in him will not perish. And that phrase, perish, is not speaking to your eternal state. It's speaking to the fact that you're wasting away here on earth because of some hurt or some pain or some unmet expectation, some hope that hasn't yet been realized. The everlasting life or the eternal life that John's speaking about is a quality of life right now. God loves you. On the other side of good grief is wellness, and strength, and power, and the ability to navigate the negativity that is all around you. So I want you to take this wafer and I want you to be thankful to Jesus for coming in the form of a man or a baby, only to become a man, a person. He took on flesh, that's what this represents. Ultimately, he surrendered his body to the crucifixion and took upon his body, this little wafer represents his body, took upon his body all the sin of humanity. He loves you. So go ahead, thank him, would you, and then consume it. This little cup of juice, it represents the difference between impotence and potency. And what I'm talking about here is impotence is the inability to do what you want to do or should do. It's your, it's your lack of power. It's sort of the I can't do it in life. I'll never be able to do it in life. It's that place in life where, where you feel so stuck, you wonder if you'll ever be able to progress one more step. You just, you just feel like, like, like it's over, or you feel like you can't move on, or you feel like somehow life will never be what you hope or want it to be. This little cup represents your future. The shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ is literally the power of God coursing through our veins. It's our life surrendered so that his life can flow. And what we can't do, he can do. What we're unable to do, he can do. This represents a New Testament word called dunamis, which means power. This little cup of juice is representative of the power of Jesus living in and through us, taking us through. And if there's ever a Christmas where you want to be with Jesus taking you through, why not let 2023 be that Christmas where Jesus is with you every step of the way, empowering you towards the most memorable and helpful Christmas you've ever had. So I want you to just take this and I want you to thank Jesus for the power that he gives you through his shed blood. Oh, we're so thankful, Lord. We're so thankful. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Holy Spirit, make, 
these wonderful gifts that you give us, most importantly, your son, so real to us during this Christmas season. Thank you, Jesus, for loving on us, for caring about us. Thank you in Jesus' name. Hey, we're gonna worship. We're gonna conclude with worship. We'll be done in just a few minutes. Don't leave. Please don't leave. Don't be those people, by the way, who, who leave early so as to get out of the parking lot. Don't be that person, okay? <laughs> don't do that. I've heard that there are a few, and I... Don't do that. Stick around. Where do you got to go on a Sunday afternoon anyway? So, so just stick around. Experience the fullness of, of worship. Would you please? God is still moving. He's still speaking. Let's worship him together. Stand with me, would you? Let's worship him together. And then we'll conclude and go off in Jesus' name. Church, let us worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Let's sing it out. In the darkness we were away. Till from heaven Can you, you came the running, there okay. was Jeff mercy in Let's your eyes okay, okay, okay. to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin king. The word from the throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Let's sing it out together.
Praise God, praise the King of Kings, our Lord of Lords. We're gonna be celebrating him all through this month. Listen, invite your friends, would you? I wanna just give you, actually, Pastor, Pastor Jeff put together a great little video here. Check it out while you're standing, don't move. Just check this video out. Some ways to exploit your digital social media accounts in a way that's helpful this year. So here, check it out. Hey everyone, and Merry Christmas. Here at The Bridge, we wanna make inviting friends and family to Christmas at The Bridge as easy as possible. So with that in mind, here are three easy ways that you can invite your friends and family this Christmas season. The first, as you can see in the corner of this video, is a QR code. If you scan this code with your phone, it'll take you to a digital invitation with our Christmas times, shareable graphics, and a button to our Christmas site. You'll see this QR code in our services and Atrium TVs this season. So when you see it, scan away and share. The second way to invite this season is by going to bridgetochristmas.ca. Here you'll find all of our Christmas times and information, including downloadable graphics for you to share on your personal social media. You could even text these graphics to your friends or send them in a mass email to everyone you know. Yep, you can be that person, but for a good reason this time. The third way you can invite this season is to grab a physical handout. Now remember, these aren't for you. These are for you to take and give to your friends. You can find these physical handouts in our Connection Center and throughout the atrium. These have all of our Christmas seasonal information as well as our Christmas site with more details as mentioned previously. So with these digital and physical invite tools in your tool belt, we hope that you share and invite. We truly can't wait to see you and yours around the bridge this Christmas season. All right. Pastor Jeff and Kathy Moe, thank you so much for giving us some tools to use throughout the Christmas season. Thank you for your work and communications. Everyone, don't forget, if you brought groceries, bring them to the uh, commons area there. Caleb is there ready to receive those. If you forgot, we need to be that kind of church where we are giving sometimes out of our need. And so, and we all know that prices are high on food, but the food bank and the master's pantry just down the street needs food. And there are gonna be hundreds of families that are gonna to need to access that over the Christmas season. So just don't forget to, to talk to Caleb. If you didn't bring food with you today, uh, listen, go talk to Caleb and say, when can I get it here this week? I'll drop it off, because it's happening this week, okay? Thank you for your giving and your generosity here at the bridge. God bless you. Have a great, great Sunday, all right? God bless.